Bom, continuando, o painel número 9, Educação para o Pleno Emprego. Tenho o prazer de chamar o professor Rodolfo Fiorini. Por favor, professor. Rodolfo Fiorini is professor of bioengineering in the Department of Electronics, Information and Bioengineering at the Politecnico di Milano University in Italy, responsible for the main course of well-being technology assessments in, the, in this department. He gained his PhD degree in energetics from Politecnico di Milano University. Professor Fiorini is the founder and coordinator of the research group of computational information conservation theory. He has published over 300 articles and presentations in international journals, books, etc. Professor Fiorini is a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, just uh, an operational uh, recommendation. Uh, the um, uh, presentation of this panel will be given in reverse order uh, respecting in the, the printed program, okay? And um, so I invite uh, to join this panel Marcel van der Dorn, van der Dorn and Neantro Saavedra Rivano and Luis Bevilacqua. I'd like to, to start uh, just uh, my, my little introduction to give you the, the tone of, the, of this panel. That is, uh, education for full employment is a big, big uh, topic. And so, you know already my, my sentence, my usual sentence, that, that we have to use new eyes. Huh? And so, contrary to popular belief, most AI systems currently act as a complement to humans instead of replacing them symbiotic systems. According to expert estimates, we are still decades away from general artificial intelligence and full automation. But eventually there will come a day where robots will perform most tasks and the role of humans in the production cycle will be marginal. It is very hard to envision the dynamics of a robot-driven economy. But how will humans sustain their lives when robots take all their jobs? Government should impose an income tax on robots that replace humans, Bill Gates suggested in 2017. The Microsoft founder proposed that the robot tax could finance jobs to which humans are particularly well suited. This can include taking care of elderly people or working with kids in schools for which needs are unmet. Other experts are endorsing the notion of a universal basic income or ending out unconditional money to all citizens. The concept has been around for centuries, but it is gaining traction as full automation starts to loom on the horizon. Just to, for your knowledge, for instance, in Italy right now, our uh, new elected politicians are just discussing the, this kind of a solution. There are many political, economic, and ethical hurdles to the full implementation of the UBI, but pilot programs are underway. Governments, as well as private firms, are testing the concept in small scale. We have yet to see how the accelerating evolution of AI will unfold, but what is for sure is that the fundamental changes lie ahead. While we cannot predict the future, we can prepare for its potential outcome as best as we can. Education is the key facilitator. But uh, never forget, huh? the uh, work is always in progress. So any time confusion is just behind the door. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, if you want to know more, I'm pretty sure that you already found uh, on the table the flyer of uh, the conference I will organize uh, next July 2019 in Milano. That is just uh, the, the first opportunity, it's a big experiment, the first opportunity to try to build a new language between technical people and social people just to, to grow together to, uh, it, and try to develop a better system for the social user and giving uh, the social user the right feedback on the state of the advanced technology just for, to, be, uh, uh, to avoid to be fooled by fake news that you can read on newspapers or, or magazines or, or just on books, you know? And, um, and so 
There, there will be topics uh, especially suited for the social track, like a foundation of, the, of symbiotic systems, technology and society, symbiotic autonomous systems, mind thinking and rationality, value judgment in decision making, social implication of AI, human machine cooperation, creativity and wisdom, emotion effect and effective computing, roles of AI in social organization, computation and intelligent in art, uh, science and art symbiosis, education for science versus art, and I think the most important one is, uh, will, be, will become in the next future the, con the discrimination between concrete and abstract, abstract sciences. Uh, you saw uh, this morning the presentation of Oliver, the, 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 uh, Olivier, they, they gave uh, just an example, a practical example of, uh, of a new way of approaching education, but that was a, 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 an example completely dedicated of what will be called soft science. Our science are science that require, you know, more uh, practical tools, just not virtuals. And so we'll be, uh, the future will be quite interesting to see how th uh, things will articulate. And now I start uh, 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 introducing um, the first speaker of our panel, uh, Professor Marcel van der Woerde. is a professor at the University of Technology Delft at the Netherlands, former director of CERN, European Organization for Nuclear Research, as you know, in Geneva, director of Max Planck Institute in Germany and the European Commission, rapporteur for the Bologna Minister Declaration Erasmus Program and advisor to multiple ministers of education in Europe, member of the World Academy of Arts and Science. So, uh, please, the the floor is, is yours. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers, the President, the CEO, Secretary General from the uh, VAS, the World Academy, to invite me to one of the uh, nice uh, places in the world, Brazil with the wonderful people. I'm always very impressed about Brazilian people. Also during this time, I was very much shocked with the introduction by the president of VAS when he said, or he mentioned, so many unemployment from young people, people who studied at the university up to 20, 22, 25 years old, and then we have to wait for a long time to have a job. I was really shocked. If I compare that with my situation at the University of Technology, Delft is one of the various places. The students, they leave more normally, or they should leave before at the end of their studies to get a good job. Industry is already there, all professors from academies or there already, and the same thing in the Max Planck Institute. So people get fantastic jobs for the rest of their life with wonderful careers. I would also like to see that. Now I'm here in the session also to tell you how is my feeling in respect to how to get a job, a good job here in Brazil and also for the future. I will give some criteria. Now, I was asking too many questions here, but I've got such a resonance. So many people contacted me and said, as a first point, what is now the new revolution? What is that now everybody talks about, but what is it really? And I will give you a, a few of these examples. And then to say what you have to study in order to, get, to become a good member in the so-called fourth revolution. First of all, in what I am presently myself involved, into the so-called new revolution, new revolution that is for sciences, for industry, every talks about the industrial revolution, industrial, that means and also economics, and then also social, etc., etc. But is the industry still the driving force? Well, one of the first is, <laughs> I leave after this session, I leave to Europe. Do you know? 13, 12 hours in the plane, and then still a lot of traveling there. In the new industrial revolution, 
I take here the helicopter in Rio, bring me at a certain few hundred meters, thousand meters height, I take the space shuttle and brings me to Europe, and one hour later, I'm really picked up in Brussels by another helicopter and brings me down. That is what we are doing at NASA at present. It's a NASA program in which I'm involved. You know about Tesla. Tesla wanted to, to have a train 1,000 kilometers an hour. For the time being, the trains are 200 or 300 maybe. He is launching now that train 1,000 kilometers. In last August, in Los Angeles, Tesla was putting for, it was two years ago, that you could be a candidate for a project. And also my students at the University of Technology in Delft, they made a proposal, developed a train, a prototype, got the first prize in August. The first prize is one million dollars. It's not nothing as the first prize of the so-called first train, 1,000 kilometers an hour. So from here to, I don't know, 2,000 kilometers to, um, uh, to, your, uh, to, the, uh, to the capital or uh, to uh, Sao Paulo, well, you will do it in less than two hours by train. You can read and do everything you want. If you look about another example, uh, so many people who die and have problems with cancer in Bethesda, in the United States, not far away from Washington. There, we are already trying to solve that very simply. An injection, and a week later, it's finished your cancer. That is industrial revolution. And that is often based, it was yesterday, it's well defined by the president of the McKenzie University. He gave that very good. He had also a center at his uh, a nano center. And nano science and nanotechnology is one of the great bases for that future. Now, what is the nano science and nanotechnology? And a few too many people were asking me, what is the industrial? And nano science and technology, I take that as an example. And I will just say what that is. But before doing that, still about the fourth industrial revolution. The first revolution was with agriculture, by the way, 150 years ago. Brought a lot of advantages. The second one was the industrial revolution. That's the car. It's very interesting. Everybody had a car. So the second industrial revolution was very quiet. Also the train there. But the first train between Brussels and Antwerp in Belgium and Europe when the first train drove, and there was a lot of land and cows, the cows were not giving milk during two weeks. So it is an effect, a revolution could have a very strange effect on people, on animals, and on the society. The third industrial revolution was the information and communication. And I saw here everybody had something taken his pocket and everybody works with the television and it's enormous. You cannot get money from your bank or you have to go via the system. Now the fourth industrial revolution is the nanoscience. It's already announced today. We are not speaking of microelectronics in Europe anymore, but from nanoelectronics. Terro electronics, but nano is a very point, a very important kind of element. Now, what is nano? What is that? Some people were me asking me that question. Therefore, I changed drastically my lecture, which I wanted to show. But this one is not working, and that's a pity. Nano that? No, that is not yet. That is the problem. That is not nano. As if it would be nano, it would be efficient. And now here, there's a tennis ball. 
and 10 times small, 10 times smaller, and 10 times smaller, and 10, and then you can see cancer cells, what the, the dimension is, and then you go smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you get to the nanometers, 10 to the minus nine, so nano is something which is very, very small. And it is, everything is based on nano. With nano, you can construct everything. And I will show that a little bit also in this lecture. Now, in respect to the nano, things which are natural, which you find in nature, but the nano man-made are very similar kind of topics. I cannot go in all these details. If you gave nanomaterials in the biofield, at the end you have the biohydro materials like biosensing. What is biosensing? It will tell you that in, ten, in 20 years that you have cancer or your cancer is coming in 20 years, you can really measure that. But you have also simulating the nature. You could simulate, for example, my students at Max Planck Institute, they make a tree from nano. And the tree is not a synthetic tree, that is a biodegradable tree. So there are so many topics about the nano type of materials. One of the big problems is to work in the nano field, to work in the industrial revolution area who is coming, the nano field is very difficult to make nano materials very difficult to make those, and they are very costly. And I think, I yesterday understood, there is only one center in Brazil that is the center of that professor or rector of the Mackenzie. And I think you need thousands of laboratories and so on. There are laboratories, but they can only make it in one function, that is steel, nano steel, to make that steel is 10,000 higher. And it's already used today. You have probably heard here also in Brazil about that bridge who fell down in Italy two months or three or four months ago. We are now building a nano bridge there, a bridge which is much stronger. The steel is thousand, uh, like the nano carbons, a thousand times stronger than steel. So there is a reality. Nano you will felt in everything, nano buildings, nano, archi nano architect, Everything what you could think, if you look a little bit about, last week I got still an email when I was here about cleaning the windows of the cathedral in Milano. Takes an enormous amount of money and work, etc. 100,000 in order to clean all those and we do it every five, six years. That will be in future nano glasses and you don't have to clean it anymore, it's finished. Rain will take the dirty stuff simply away. So, that are some examples which you have. Now, to make the nano is a difficult exercise. And nano with one function, okay. With, with two or three or five or six or seven functions, it's more difficult. If you treat cancer, you inject the nanos, you give a function, take to the nanos, look about the cancer cells, wherever in your body. Then you give a second function, enter in it, give another function, kill them, and another function go out. That is more or less, we could direct completely everything in life, not only for the cancer, but in many, many fields. That is the orientation, what we have into. Now, to measure the so-called, to measure these small particles is a very difficult kind of an exercise. In order to measure them, a microscope, the microscope which we have at Max Planck are five stores high and the, the, without, we bombard the material in order to analyze your material. So it is very, very difficult and very, very costly in order to do that. But I don't like to go too further. Where can nano be used and is used in energy, in all kinds of energy savings? In all kinds of environment, for example, cleaning water, to clean the water bacteriologically. I gave an example for ELF, for transport, for information, from micro to nano in safety aspects. But there is also a certain problem about the nano in the environment, the nano in ELF. 
If you eat nano, you don't know where the nano particles may stay in your body and may give problems. Therefore, nano foods, we have a lot of development of nano foods. There will be not enough food for the seven um, mil milliards of people, of more people in future. There's no food. So we have to find new foods. Nano foods is one of the big solutions. But nano in food is for the time being not accepted. It's not approved by the FAO, it's not improved by the governments, because we don't yet know. The science is not far enough in order to find out what damage also nano in your body could do. So we don't know yet what is green and what is red. So the nano field, like nano chocolates, there is certainly nano already in the chocolate, but on the packages, you will never find it. It's a big crisis about this topic. The same thing normally nano food, you will certainly have already foods where you have nano in it, but it is still under great discussion. So we have in this topic the ethics of the so-called nano science is still a very complex. Therefore, we cannot use the nano in medicine. We cannot use the nano in food sciences and not in others because we don't know yet what is green and what is the red. So it is a big kind of uh, uh, problem. Now, nano in medicine, you cannot read everything, but you have nano in medicine cancer treatment, and so many other kinds of treatments there are already in study. Nano in dentistry, if you look to the Tokyo University, the work and the fantastic work which is being done, nano in dentistry. Well, I will give you a more detailed picture about that. Nano pharmaceuticals, nano in healthcare, Nano in cosmetics, so the ladies with the nano cosmetics, that are the ladies with the fantastic visions. But we are never sure about when the nano goes through and comes in the blood, in the blood a, uh, uh, circuit. That is one of the problems what we have with the nano cosmetics. And there are great studies being done all over Europe and America and Asia and probably also here. If you look about Oreal and all these products, it's very critical. Then you have in nano agriculture. <laughs> there was this, uh, I think the Secretary General of VAS was talking about the DDT. Here is the final solution. You, uh, you use the DDT, but the nano DDT and the nano DDT will not give you problems. What he was showing with the DDT, that is in respect to the agriculture. And then also, like I say, the nano in food sciences. But you have, that was the area of health. Another example that is, that is what we developed at the Max Planck Institute. That is a textile, a jacket for young ladies from 18, 20 years old, that they can go at night and that they are this jacket has everything. That is a jacket which contains all elements which are possible into the jacket. Also, if you are attacked, the aggressor you will get is reaction. So that is really an ideal jacket. It costed too much. It is not yet on the market. But that was what developed was at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And then you have also here the uh, solution about all possibilities what you could think in the energy sector, in energy, in hydrogen, in solar, where the so-called nano will play a role in the future. If you look here to the engine, the engine of the future, the engine on what Rolls Royce and the future are really work, that is a kind of the engine of the future for the planes, etc. And now the point about, yeah, that is now the fourth generation in a few examples. Now, what studies should and what qualifications should a student, should a graduate have in, for the next fourth generation? And that are the points, what you need. If a student has those points, he gets a job for the rest of his life. He will have on this basis, and I cannot go in all the details, but I will only take one element in detail that is on what we have various discussions, that is the 
multidisciplinarity and the transdisciplinarity. We'll go in detail. But with that curriculum, and that curriculum has been developed by a large number of universities in the United States, Europe, and Asia together. And that are more or less the conclusions. You will get that in the proceedings, probably from this, uh, uh, from this conference. Now, what is now multi and transdisciplinarity? Let me go still simply to the multidisciplinarity. If you are working as a chemist in inorganic materials, in a laboratory, an institute, inorganic materials institute. When you are working in that institute, then you certainly can develop a number of products, and there are Nobel Prize winners who are coming from that one. The same thing if you are working in organic plastics and so on, and polymers, you certainly will discover something. But if you have the knowledge of both, then you will really be able to invent that one you will be able to invent this one. So these topics you will not invent if you are a scientist in that specific laboratory. And the same thing for this one. And you could extrapolate with many other laboratories. So if you have both together. Now, if, they have, if these two are together, and if you are then also in contact, not only contact, but also the deep knowledge of the natural materials, then you could also look about intelligent materials. What is an intelligent material? Intelligent material, that is, if an aeroplane flies, and if there is a crack somewhere, that uh, um, the materials, where the crack is, say to the pilot, look, I'm in a great problem here. You should land immediately, or, and what he can do is, he can repair it. That are intelligent materials. Intelligent materials, that is materials who can talk to you, who say what it is a problem. And that are the materials for the future. They can only be detected if you have the knowledge there and there inside the intelligent. And the same thing is that if you have both, then you could do and invent many, many type of materials which is needed. If you have a job and if you have a PhD in one of the, what has been said before, you have a PhD in the area of the inorganic materials. Now, in future, the industrial revolution the requires much, much more than that one. And therefore, it is very important to have the multi, a multi-interdisciplinary education. And give you an example. At the BASF, a big chemical company in Germany. We have settlements all over the world. It was a stable company. 50 years ago, a PhD in chemistry got a job for his life. But today, what is happening? B BASF reduces drastically their chemical sector, buys food sciences, buys electronic components, and we have done only PhDs in chemistry who has no knowledge in the other field. What is PSF doing? The people are 40, 50 years old, and they kick them out. It's very difficult if you are 40, 50 years old to find another job. If you are then a chemist, to find a job, and during these 10 years you got a good salary, to go and move elsewhere is a big problem. Now, what is then being done in Europe? Well, retrain, retrain, that is, <laughs> What can you do with retrain? You have a, a, a doctorate degree in chemistry, you have to train you in what, electronics and so on. That is that's absolutely not useful. And at the end, he will not be an expert in the field, he doesn't well understand it, etc. He will get a lower salary and he will be disappointed for the rest of his life. So it is very important to have a multidisciplinary uh, education as otherwise you may get a lot of problems. Now, what education? What should you study? Now, our proposal, and that is a study which has been made between the United States and Europe, particularly with the National Science Foundations and American Academies, that is the training what the university should give. 
not only a training for a specific degree, but that is a training for a multidisciplinary person for which he can really open the doors for his future. And that you will see a lot of languages is in the first year, that's for a bachelor degree. In the first year, he got all the languages near physics and I don't know what, but he also gets complementary studies that may be theology or there may be philosophy of that may be human sciences in the field. And his laboratory research is not only the research into the field of, uh, uh, not only in the field of a specific, uh, a specific heat in a laboratory, but that is a project which is with industry already from the beginning that the project is with industry and you will see that is over so called social sciences and everything is increasing so that you're really making somebody who is an excellent scientist who knows the society who knows that the society and that he needs the society that he needs him he knows about ethics he knows about economy he knows about the languages etc and that is more or less a kind of a basis of what we want like to see now if you it is not only a problem for the students but the university has to play an important role you have no year sit in universities and the university is not offering it. Let me give an example, my personal. If you are a medical doctor, it takes six, seven years. And then you study engineering, it takes still five years. In future, we need doctors, engineers together with a training of five, six years. That is already installed in Harvard university starting with that. We would like to follow that. But it is not only for a medical doctor and engineer, but it is also could be for a medical doctor and for an insurance company. Of, so you need absolutely various kind of... Uh, uh, so the university plays here an important role for the students, but also the research centers. I discussed it yesterday with the rector Mackenzie, but also the industry and then the society. And you need all those. And yesterday we had a session about innovation, how to create an innovation. And innovation is created at the university because the industry cannot do it and is not doing. The discoveries are at university. But if you have a discovery at the university, it's completely disconnected from the rest of the society, from the research laboratory, from the industry, from the government who has to pay in order to promote it, you will not go very far. And that is really what the duties are. We have really duties for the various kind of bodies. And then a, uh, what is very important also in a university, that is to create the education together with the research, innovation, and at the end, so education with research come to the innovation and then in all kinds of fields, so this environment, health, in order to get the product. And then you will be really successful into that uh, your topic. If you go, and I don't like to go to get the rules, what again for the future, I can really tell you that if you don't have that education in the future, you will have no good jobs. And at the end, you will, not, you will not get a job because the industry requires people with this kind of education, what I'm saying. Google in Geneva, what I already said before, they couldn't find their people. What is Google doing to set up their own university? The industry has great problems. There are many jobs available and they don't find the people for the job. There is a big gap. And I think we cannot wait and wait because the future industry will be a completely different industry. And the industry is so different and will widen from the university that between the university and the industry, not only the industry, that could be insurance companies and everything. And that is one of the big problems. And today that is already felt. If we go to the Deutsche Bank, the Deutsche Bank, 
They have no big department in nanoscience and nanotechnology. If you go to assurance company like AXA or others, there you will also get a number of uh, serious problems. And an insurance company cannot insure something what they don't know. I don't uh, can go too much further what I would not like to do. The point is what I wanted to say, that the multidisciplinarity is such an important kind of element. And our universities are not prepared, and our universities are not prepared for it. And uh, this is uh, a great sorry and damage for the students. The students will not be, are not prepared for that one. And we are very concerned in Europe. And the last point that I want to say is, we in Europe, we had a big problem in the past, as 25 years ago, we had 30 different countries in Europe with a different syllabus and different there are engineering schools in the past in Europe with three years and you got engineer and you have other countries seven years. We have tried and find the system. We find it that was developed in 95 and in 2010 all universities of Europe had to follow the same system. This allows that students can start and study in all areas, in all universities, recognized by all universities and recognized by the industry. And that is also a very important point. Nanoscience and the fourth revolution is worldwide and Brasilia is a part of worldwide. And one should also have educational systems in which one had the exchanges and similar kind of programs in various continents. Now, we in Europe are very well advanced with the United States. We have now launching the systems with Japan and also with China. And I think and hope that also with Brazil and with South America, something could be done. Otherwise, all South Americans, good people, will not find a job here as your industry will not only your industry, the industry is worldwide and there will be many influences worldwide on all the industries. So that is that Europeans will take the important jobs here and the second category you can go and find a job elsewhere. And I think it's a very important topic that is that we have to think that the fourth industrial revolution is a world exercise and one has really to be careful and I think there are not enough studies done on, by the United Nations in respect to countries like Africa and other areas as we will go further and further away from each other and concerning the topic of to be gentle with your neighbor I think we are not yet so far the value what has been said this morning the value of people the value of training has gone in many, many countries, and that is a real pity. To get it back is not very easy. And an industrial revolution will make more distance between the people. And we see that already in many countries that the distance between people, the distance between families, within the families, is becoming longer and longer. I can only say, I wish you all the best here in the country. I had. I planned, planned a long talk in many more details, a talk in a completely different field, but I had to say that because there were too many people in that room who came to say me, what is that and how could we solve it and in which way we should think. And I've tried just to give a few of those indications. In any case, I thank you for your attention and I would also like to say... That you, I'd like to say that it was a nice time for me in this area and I say now goodbye to you all. My plane is waiting and I uh, fly back to Brussels. But it was a nice time here and I was very pleased all the contacts with these people. Many thanks. Thank you, Professor Van der Borde. Maybe questions. Here. Yes, yes. Yes, you have time for questions? Yes. Okay. And, and so a few questions. Uh, Thank you, Marcel, for a very stimulating, insightful presentation, very important area. My question is, in, your, in what's going on in Europe on multidisciplinarity, as you have been speaking, 
how much emphasis is there in the training of our future scientists on understanding, not, I'm not talking about the technology now, I'm talking about the social applications or in the formulation of understanding how the society is changing and how the technology will impact on those changes in future. So you mentioned very briefly, I'd like just to know more, to what extent are our scientists really understanding the social applications and the social implications of the new technology? Well, I think it goes already far in Europe. If you look about the universities themselves, if you take again a university like the Delft University, it is impossible to get a PhD in a specific field anymore. If you take more or less sciences in uh, chemistry, it's not possible to get a PhD in chemistry or a PhD in biology or something. You get a, an, an, you get a degree which is multidisciplinary in the education in that field. But if I take the Catholic University in Leuven, in Belgium, in humanities, they do the same thing about economics, together with the so-called uh, philosophy and so on, they also get training already into that field. So universities or the best universities in Europe are already available and have changed that with great problems because you have there a number of professors, a number of professors who are in a specific one line. Well, what are you doing at the Delft University? You sent them home at 50 years, although that they have a permanent contract with 65, and you put a lot of money in them and you kick them out and you find others. That is going on. And the contracts with professors are not anymore for the rest of their life. And the professors get also the criteria and the conditions that they have to do with multidisciplinarity. But if you look at the European Commission about the big programs which we have, in order to apply for a project, you must also show your multidisciplinarity aspects. So it is already well on the way in Europe into that field. And the people, they understand that because the industry and all the innovations and the new industries, they are all interested in such kind of people. So the society is already going. In the United States, the multidisciplinarity aspect was already there much more than in Europe. But it is catastrophic in Japan. As if you look about to the so-called Tokyo University, one of the best universities, their courses are still very vertical. But in the discussions, they have no plans that also a revolutionary development in Japan will take place. Now, in Japan, it is very, very difficult. They have great difficulties. In China, it seems much more easier. If you look to the Tsinghua University, one of the best universities in China, they, are much, they can force much more their people. Their people can work much harder. But it is not very easy for the professors, for the university to do something. And we have great difficulties, particularly in Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe. It is much easier in the central part of Europe and in the northern part, like Sweden. There, it is also well adopted. And we are very well afraid in Europe about the southern part of Europe with Italy, with Spain, with uh, um, Portugal and so on. Uh, these people had to do still a great effort and it is much, it is quite difficult. But what do we see is that the big managers in, the, in Italy and, and so on, also in France, they have their difficulties that there are the big managers are coming from abroad. Switzerland is again a country where everything goes very smoothly. But if you look a little bit about Switzerland in respect to the Ecole Politique Federale de Lausanne or the uh, Zurich University, we have an enormous platform of innovators coming from all over the world in order to invent there. And uh, it is clear that many top people, top scientists from the world, because it is a worldwide exercise, they come there. So it is already in Europe, <laughs> not sufficiently, but they understood that something has to happen. And it is not only a kind of, I study this and I do something additional in something else. That is not interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity is that it goes on together that you understand. Interdisciplinarity 
uh, director Mackenzie, he told me yesterday, yes, but we are sending them some samples for, I said, who is analyzing your nanosciences? Oh yes, we can send them to this university, you can send them that. But that is not multidisciplinarity. You send something and the others, they don't understand you, what you are doing, and prepare them. So they cannot analyze what these people are thinking. And there, a lot of work has still to be done. The development of technology is exponential. I don't understand how you can ensure to the youngsters here that they will have work for 41 years when there are other technologies beyond, uh, beyond uh, uh, nanotechnology that are going to take place, like the use of entanglement or like the use of quantic technologies that are only starting and they are not teach in the university. We need also a change in, in consciousness. We need a change in our psychology. It's not only a question about technological development, in my view. I want to know... That, well, that is 100% yes. clear. But the examples you are taking about the environment, there is an enormous amount of effort. If you look a little bit about the nanoscience, as nanoscience is a very important topic in the environmental problem. I would not like to say about what is the, uh, the, the, the global change and so on of temperatures and where, but uh, uh, one is working very hard. There is an institute, an international institute. It doesn't depend from the United Nations, but it's very closely linked in Vienna, near Vienna. And there, they have a very solid, a very strong group from the best people in the world how to try to solve the problems of the environment. And we can solve many problems. If you look a little bit, I was, when I came here, they said, you should not drink from the water, the water in your room. You should not drink about it. I was surprised. It's such an easy problem. Nanotechnology by just membranes with nickel or with silver that you put on your nano branch and all the bacteria will be kicked and, and dead. So you have just a simple membrane and you put your dirty water and it's clear. So there are already many, many problems. If you look a little bit about the cities and about the diesel engines in cities, also the nano science is there a fantastic solution for it. At nano science, but not only nano science, but nano science go fair. If you go to robotics, what have been said, it is not the robotics will will do it. It are the nano robotics which are important into that field. It are the nano in various other areas. And I would still like what I couldn't say to the students here. Don't make to the students like you said in one year what one can do. Don't go for a doctor degree in Brazil. If I would be of rectors of an advice to Brazil, and I will do that to the minister, the new the new pen who are coming. Don't let these people go here in Brazil for doctor's degree. Let them get two disciplines, two master degrees. A master degree in what they would like, chemistry, physics, mathematics, I don't know what, and another master in economics. But together, try to make models, not separate or not supplementary, but completely integrated. That are ways. What I would like to all these students, which I, some of the students ask me, and I made a, a plan for some of the students, that they say, well, that and that is what we would like to do, that you make something together. But the universities have the great responsibility to make programs so that the problems, somebody who is in environment, that he can go at the same way, together do it. That the syllabus, what I've shown, that it is something which goes completely together, and not that one does it, and then afterwards, what supplement? That is not helping the old exercise. But uh, the, uh, the society today is very much afraid, very much afraid about the fourth revolution <laughs> at the European Commission. There are very big people who are really say, stop with this, thought, with this technology. And I can tell you, the technology will help solving many problems. If you, for instance, have to be careful for the young people, these young people to study medicine, we don't need medicine anymore. The medical doctors are not needed in the future. Why should you say that we should medicine? You do the medicine at your home. You don't need the medicine. 
you will make your analysis and send it to that one. You could say, but I don't like to do it, I need my doctor. But you will not be, you will be forced by the society to do that, like you are now forced in the electronics to do some things which you don't like to do. You are forced to that one. And you have that in many fields. Like there was somebody who asked uh, my grandson, he would like to do chirurgy. I said, stop with chirurgy, don't do chirurgy. We don't do chirurgical uh, medical doctors anymore. It will be if you have an, a, an accident, you go to a clinic, and it is the doctor in mass, in, I don't know in which country, the specialist institutes, he will from there operate you, and much better, like the nanorobotics and the nanotechnology which we have available, that is men, the doctor, uh, the best doctors from Harvard of I don't know where, that they could uh, operate in Brazil. Uh, you have to put them just on your desk and they will really uh, centralize it and operate them in the, opera, in the ideal way. And then it's much better than, 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 than your medical doctor, as your medical doctor or your expert is making so many errors with you and they will not take place. So I think there are many guidances which I could give but it is clear that the science and the community and the ethics must grow together into one thought. And I'm sure that the Industrial Revolution will make the world better and will give an opportunity for peace. If the world meets together, like it has often been said to me, became, how do you go to Brazil? Be careful for that one, be careful for this, careful for that one. That are people who don't know the Brazilians. You must know each other. Nanotechnology and all the transport possibilities, what you have available, they will help to get a better world. And that, I think, is very important. Thank you, Professor. I'm sorry I, we finished our, our time slot. Thank you. Okay. So we proceed to the second presentation, and uh, uh, I call uh, Professor Neantro Saavedra Rivano, that is, a, he is graduated by the Facultad de Ciencias, Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería of Lima, Peru, has a master's degree um, from Instituto de Matematica, University of Lille uh, 1, uh, fr uh, in France. Master and PhD from the Economics Department of Columbia University and doctor degree from the Department of Mathematics, University Paris Sud 11. Emeritus professor at the University of Tsukuba in Japan and associate researcher from Brasilia University. Member of the World Academy of Art and Science. In economics, he has worked mainly in international trade and development economics, particularly in the areas of public policies, human capital, and regional integration. So please. Uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Para completar el conjunto de idiomas de esta mesa, voy a hablar en español, ya que mi colega que viene a seguir hablará en portugués. Así tendremos representados los tres idiomas de esta conferencia. Pero los eh, slides están en inglés, de manera que es más fácil seguirlos. Bueno, es un gran placer estar aquí para hablar sobre este tema, el futuro de la educación, y en este panel que tiene que ver con un título optimista, Educación para Pleno Empleo. Yo voy a dar aquí una nota un poco más escéptica, y es el título Educación para un futuro con empleo incierto. Primero, vamos a revisar algunos conceptos que, de los cuales hemos estado hablando a lo largo de esos tres días, pero a veces no queda muy claro. Eh, cuál es el qué es lo que queremos decir por cada uno de ellos en primer lugar el futuro futuro naturalmente es en principio infinito puede ir muy lejos o puede ir muy cerca puede ser el futuro de, de aquí hasta el coffee break mañana eh, 2030 cuando la industria 4.0 habrá llegado a su plenitud o más allá eh, esta mañana conversaba con Paulo Barone, el director de, de Educación Superior en el Ministerio de Educación, y, y hablando sobre este tema, él me decía, bueno, 2030 va a ser el año, si alguien empieza en la educación básica ahora, en 2030 va a estar entrando en la universidad. 
Entonces, 2030 es un futuro muy próximo, está a la vuelta de la esquina. Eh, yo quiero mirar un poco más allá. Eh, no está muy claro cuándo la industria 4.0 habrá llegado a su plenitud, pero seguramente va a ser un poco más de tiempo. Entonces, digamos que el futuro es un futuro más distante, más o menos 50, 80 años. Sí, 80 años es conveniente, es casi 2100, es el fin de este siglo. Otro término, educación. En realidad, ¿estamos hablando de educación o de aprendizaje? Porque muchas veces se notó aquí que, no podemos, que la educación no termina eh, con la educación formal, que nosotros estamos aprendiendo, o sea, no educándonos continuamente y que la universidad, las escuelas se refieren a la educación básica, pero todos estamos aprendiendo en cualquier momento a hacer todos, inclusive yo creo que en este momento, ojalá que yo pueda decir algo que contribuya a nuestro aprendizaje sobre estos conceptos. Entonces, el aprendizaje yo creo que es la palabra que cabe mejor. Una perspectiva latinoamericana, bueno, yo soy latinoamericano, siempre tengo simpatía eh, por estos enfoques que vengan desde aquí. Eh, yo creo que a medida que el futuro va más y más allá, eh, pierde un poco sentido las perspectivas regionales. Eh, pero si se mira el futuro de plazo próximo, seguramente, porque hay tantas diferencias, eh, América Latina está todavía muy atrás en relación con Europa o Japón o Estados Unidos. Entonces, yo creo que sí, cabería, ¿no? de cierta forma, una perspectiva latinoamericana. Industria 4.0. Aquí, naturalmente, se ha hablado mucho sobre esto, inclusive sobre si es industria, por qué se usa ese término. Yo creo que el término no es, es un poco infeliz, porque las grandes empresas asociadas con la revolución eh, económica que está ocurriendo son empresas como Google, eh, Apple, que aún cuando produce hardware, pero es en realidad una empresa de diseño, y bueno, Amazon, eh, Microsoft, ninguna de ellas es una industria en el, sentido, en el sentido clásico del término. Entonces, se refiere esto a, una, a un complejo de tecnologías que están llegando y que están eh, alimentándose unas con otras. Obviamente, nanotecnología es una de estos componentes importantes, pero no es la única. Tenemos la inteligencia artificial, cloud computing, en fin, muchas cosas, eh, todo junto es lo que estamos llamando industria 4.0. No, es, no es un buen término, pero es el que se usa. Bien, después de haber puesto así los, como se dice, los puntos en las IES, eh, como decimos en español o en portugués, pingos las IES, hablemos más sobre el futuro del trabajo, ¿no? ya que este panel tiene que ver con educación y empleo. ¿Cuáles son los drivers importantes y cuáles son los desafíos que enfrenta bueno, obviamente la industria 4.0 es uno de estos drivers. Va a tener gran impacto en el mercado de trabajo, impactos que todavía no se entienden muy bien, algunos de los cuales ya discernimos. Otro driver importante son las tendencias demográficas. Estas son las famosas pirámides poblacionales y da una idea así, cómo se pasa de la una, estamos transitando hacia otras, en las cuales la población envejece más, y naturalmente la estructura, eh, grupos de edades dentro de la población cambian, eh, entonces menos niños, eh, eh, más ancianos, eh, la población, los impactos económicos son, son muy variados, hasta los sistemas de, de prevención social eh, y, y naturalmente cuáles son las industrias que van a ser más importantes, eh, entonces, este es un, un driver importante para el mercado del trabajo. Ahora, los desafíos. Yo veo tres desafíos. O sea, el primer desafío es lo que tiene que ver con la distribución de las ganancias, eh, o del ingreso, si quieren. Eh, porque si sí, efectivamente el impacto de las nuevas tecnologías en el trabajo es que muchas ocupaciones desaparezcan, que haya menos demanda por trabajo, entonces va a haber menos personas que trabajan, eh, aun si todas aquellas que trabajan, trabajan menos tiempo, es una tendencia muy posible, yo diría hasta probable, que haya menos. Entonces el punto ahí es eh, 
aquellos que no trabajan no van a ganar nada eh, y los que trabajan van a ganar más porque evidentemente el producto total de la economía no va a disminuir, por el contrario, la tendencia es aumentar. Entonces puede tener un efecto nefasto sobre la distribución de los ingresos. Este es un, un desafío. No voy a hablar mucho sobre esto porque no, es mucho, no entra mucho en el tema de educación. No, eh, podría entrar, pero de forma más, más indirecta. Ha, ha habido, naturalmente, se han dado algunas respuestas posibles a este desafío, como por ejemplo el de un ingreso básico universal que todo el mundo, aún si no trabaja, recibiría. Eh, hay discusiones de este tipo. Segundo desafío es las dificultades que el nuevo mercado de trabajo va a presentar. Eh, no solo por el hecho de que son ocupaciones nuevas, eh, sino que estas ocupaciones van a estar cambiando continuamente. Eh, entonces, esto es un desafío naturalmente para el mercado de trabajo y también para la educación. ¿Cómo preparar? O sea, yo francamente, lamentablemente, nuestro amigo Marcel eh, ya no está aquí, pero no creo que ninguna formación universitaria pueda dar para un excelente estudiante un trabajo para toda su vida. Él va a tener que continuar aprendiendo para eventualmente pasar de un trabajo para otro a lo largo de su vida eh, como trabajador. Eh, entonces, este es una, un desafío para la educación, eh, de cómo preparar a, los, eh, a las personas, eh, y no solamente a los que están formándose, sino a todo el mundo, los que están trabajando también, cómo prepararlos para este nuevo mercado de trabajo. Y un tercer desafío, que yo creo esta es la parte que sería más original de mi, de mi presentación hoy, porque es algo sobre lo que creo nadie ha hablado, es cómo prepararse para una situación donde va a haber quizás mucho más tiempo libre al que nosotros estamos acostumbrados. Esta eh, figura aquí, no sé si alguien la reconoce, es una escena de la película About Schmidt, con eh, Jack Nicholson, que está ahí, historia de un eh, jubilado, que se jubila y se da cuenta de que no tiene más ninguna, ningún objetivo en su vida, empieza a buscar objetivos y tiene, bueno, es, es una especie de comedia trágico, una película tragicómica, eh, porque le va muy mal en estas, eh, en estas tentativas de hacer cosas porque no está preparado. Eh, o sea, este es, el, este es el punto. Y ahí está un nombre, no, no, yo creo que no ha sido muy analizado en psicología, seguramente va a serlo cada vez más, pero algunos lo han llamado el síndrome de la desocupación, de la jubilación, retirement syndrome. Y ahora, esto no solamente se nota entre jubilados, sino también, o sea, yo creo que en, entre esta audiencia aquí, muchas personas, yo mismo, eh, a veces el domingo llega y estamos ansiosos de que llegue el lunes para empezar de nuevo a hacer, a hacer cosas. No, no estamos tan acostumbrados a usar nuestro tiempo libre. Eh, entonces, y ese tiempo libre va a aumentar. Eh, entonces, este es el concepto de ocio creativo. En realidad este concepto que no lo he inventado yo eh, fue popularizado por un sociólogo italiano, Domenico Di Masi, que es eh, muy popular. Curiosamente yo vi que no es popular fuera de Brasil o Italia. Eh, inclusive las páginas en Wikipedia creo que están solo en dos o tres idiomas. Pero es muy interesante su concepto de ocio creativo. Y, entonces, esto es algo... O sea, ¿Qué hacer con el tiempo libre? Eh, y porque en principio uno pensaría que ese es el sueño de todo el mundo, de tener, de tener mucho tiempo libre. O sea, este es el, un escritor, Richard Jeffries, que escribió esto eh, al final del siglo XIX. O sea, como una, todos deberían, ¿no? I hope succeeding generations will be able to be adult. I hope that nine tenths of their time will be leisure time, that they may enjoy their days and the earth and the beauty of this beautiful world, that they may rest by the sea and dream, that they may dance and sing, eat and drink. Suena muy bonito, pero en la práctica, eh, inclusive esto hace pensar un poco, se escribió sobre este tema hace mucho tiempo, hace casi exactamente 500 años. Este libro, todo el mundo ha oído hablar del término, por lo menos Utopía, que fue escrito por Sir Thomas More, que tuvo un final trágico a manos de Enrique VIII, 
eh, y fue publicado en mil, creo que fue en 1416, entonces, no, 1500, disculpe, porque ex exactamente la utopía ocurre en una isla que está más o menos donde están las Malvinas ahora, es una isla imaginaria, y América entonces ya había sido descubierta, fue en 1516. Y aquí eh, Tomás Mor describe en mucho detalle la vida en este lugar y se refiere al problema del trabajo. Eh, trata el problema del trabajo, inclusive del ocio, del tiempo libre. En su visión, las personas trabajarían seis horas por día. O sea, ustedes se imaginan en 1516... Eh, cuando ni siquiera se pensaba en las 40 horas semanales, colocar que se trabajaría 6 horas por día. Entonces, eh, y él lo justificaba muy bien, porque explicaba que hay mucha gente que no trabaja simplemente. Eh, todos los nobles, la iglesia, eh, personas con, con dinero, y, y aquello, entre aquellos que trabajan, algunos que su trabajo es muy poco efectivo. Entonces dijo, si todo el mundo trabaja 6 horas, va a haber de sobra para el consumo de todo el mundo. Eh, y ahí entonces decía que en el tiempo libre que habría, eh, habría seminarios, actividades artísticas, eh, entonces describía muy bien. Él ya se refería mucho, mucho antes que Domenico Di Masi ya hablaba del ocio creativo. Ahora, el punto es que, y aquí esto tiene que ver con la educación, naturalmente, la educación, y, y que no es aprendizaje, la educación nos prepara para trabajar. O sea, el objetivo de la educación es, después de no sé cuántos años, puede ser 12, 15, 18 años, al final uno sale para el mercado del trabajo. O sea, eso está muy, muy explícito. Eh, no prepara para que uno sepa usar el tiempo libre. Entonces, yo creo que esto es uno de los desafíos de la educación. Eh, la educación no debe ser solamente para el trabajo, tiene que serlo también, pero debe ser también para descubrir así los otros mundos, las otras dimensiones de la vida que existen. Y esto tiene un poco que ver, bastante que ver con lo que se llama la economía creativa, o economía naranja, que fue mencionada aquí, creo que fue por Antón eh, de la Fundación Educa, ¿no? eh, Virtual Educa, durante el primer día de esta conferencia. La economía creativa, la economía naranja, conduce de forma bastante natural a desarrollar el ocio creativo. Y esto es lo que quería decir. Muchas gracias. I introduce uh, Professor Luis Bevilacqua. He holds a bachelor degree in engineering by the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro with a specialization in bridges and large structures at the TH Stuttgart and, and doctorate in theoretical and applied mechanics by Stanford University. He is a merit professor at COP UFRI, FRJ, as an engineer worker and was a consultant for companies such, uh, such as Geotechnical, uh, Promon Engineering, Petrobras, and Valle do Rio Doce. He was the founder of the civil engineering program at COPE, a Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and was academic vice director at PUCRJ, director of COPE, and rector of Federal University of the APC. He is emeritus professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Currently, he coordinates the implementation of the Alexandria Space with the goal to stimulate interdisciplinary education in projects that contribute to the advance of a scientific knowledge. So, Professor Bevilacqua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as said my predecessor here, I am going to deliver this conference in Portuguese, but the slides are in English. Bom, eu quero falar um pouco sobre a educação para o futuro e abordar, talvez complementando o que foi uh, dito anteriormente. Né? Em primeiro lugar, nós chegamos até onde estamos, segundo eu entendo, a partir de dois grandes eventos ou dois grandes esforços que aconteceram no século passado, que é a capacidade de observação tanto do microcosmos como do macrocosmos e a capacidade computacional. São dois eventos que ocorreram e que nos levaram até a situação em que nós estamos hoje. E é uma situação que é uh, relativamente crítica, eu, eu penso. Né? E o impacto que eu quero falar um pouco, né? é simplesmente para dar como exemplo, o um impacto maior, segundo entendo, é essa indústria 4.0, a inteligência artificial, 
não é? Machine Learning, é interessante observar que esses, essa nova tecnologia e esse impacto que está sendo trazido para a nossa sociedade tem preocupado vários países. Há pouco tempo, o ano passado, a Royal Society escreveu um documento muito interessante para o governo inglês, alertando sobre os problemas e os ganhos que essa nova tecnologia está trazendo para a Inglaterra e para o mundo, né? e inclusive dando uma especial atenção para que esse problema na Inglaterra seja uh, tratado com muito cuidado, né? inclusive para não perderem a, a liderança tecnológica no mundo. Então, esse é um, um ponto importante. O mercado de trabalho está sendo fechado, um colega meu da, da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, que é especialista em inteligência artificial, escreveu ontem o seguinte, jovens, o futuro patrão de vocês vai ser um computer code, vai ser um código computacional, não vai ser uma pessoa. Então, essas novas tendências que acontecem no mundo e a velocidade com que elas andam, trazem um, um para nós uma situação que não foi vivida no passado. Nós não temos essa experiência, nós estamos vivendo uma experiência bastante nova. Terceiro, a educação profissional ela tem um limite né, bastante curto, então a tecnologia muda de tal forma que uh, fica muito difícil, eu quero acentuar a parte da educação, a educação universitária, fica muito difícil se fazer um projeto de educação universitária que garanta ao estudante, né, ao egresso, uma permanência no mercado de trabalho. Isso não existe mais. Então, nós temos que ter outro foco. Então, e esse outro foco, que isso é um pouco, uh, um pouco, uh, problema do nosso país, um pouco um problema brasileiro, né? que é preciso que os estudantes sejam educados ou treinados de tal forma que possam enfrentar os problemas de, do futuro com as suas próprias pernas, independência intelectual. A nossa cultura no Brasil é muito mais a transmissão de conhecimento, a universidade, Existe para que os professores ensinem. Isso não é verdade. A universidade existe, o seu principal papel é para que as pessoas aprendam. E hoje em dia, tanto professores como alunos até acabam aprendendo junto. E tal velocidade, com tal velocidade se processam esses avanços. Né? Então, uh, o que, que acontece com os cursos básicos para a universidade? Aqui eu quero falar, existem várias opções de educação superior, eu estou falando mais na, na, na parte universitária. Preciso que forme, claro, com um certo uh, grupo de conhecimentos técnicos e filosóficos ou sociológicos, eu vou mostrar um pouco adiante a minha proposta, mas, e, e, e profissional, né? mas, sobretudo, está preparado para a vida como cidadão e como seguir as novas propostas e os novos avanços. Isso é que a universidade pode dar hoje, ela não pode dar outra coisa, competência profissional garantida não existe. Bom, então esses são alguns dados importantes que nós consideramos. Eu quero apresentar aqui, mostrar aqui também, isso é muito interessante, Esse, em junho desse ano saiu um artigo do Kissinger, nessa revista The Atlantic Technology, e ele diz, claro, é muito interessante, eu, eu recomendo que leiam esse artigo, ele diz, e é uma pessoa que tem uma grande experiência de vida, né? inclusive de, de, uh, em várias áreas, ele é um historiador, mas ele trabalhou em, em, como uh, secretário de Estado nos Estados Unidos, né? e ele diz o seguinte, a sociedade não está preparada para a inteligência intelectual como ela está sendo feita hoje fala principalmente que é preciso que o governo americano né, tome providências para que isso seja, esse impacto seja estudado na sociedade em que se vive hoje. Né. É, é, é muito, muito interessante esse, esse artigo, do, não, 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 não temos tempo para ler isso tudo, mas é fantástico. Inclusive, relatando sobre a transformação da condição humana, né, tem começado a ser introduzida por essa nova, esse novo modo de, de se 
pensar ou o novo modo em que nós nos colocamos na sociedade diante das máquinas. Né? Mas agora eu quero então voltar, mas a universidade fazer o quê? Qual será o efeito da universidade, qual será o papel da universidade nesse novo mundo? Então, a primeira pergunta, ou a primeira menção que eu faço aqui é o seguinte, são precisos apenas quatro bases nitrogenadas e um mensageiro, é René Mensageiro, para formar a vida. Isso que nós somos, cabelo, olho, é? pele, animais com, com asas, animais sem asas, braços, pernas diferentes. Quatro bases nitrogenadas e um mensageiro. Então, eu pergunto o seguinte, para a formação dos novos cidadãos, os estudantes que estão saindo da universidade, é preciso o quê? 50 matérias, 50 disciplinas? É um pouco a nossa cultura, quer dizer, aqui no Brasil a gente tem uma, uma certa tendência de entupir os estudantes de cursos, mas não precisa isso tudo. Então, eu quero apresentar para vocês uma, uma proposta, e não é só proposta, na realidade, é uma coisa que está sendo executada. Quantas? Então, a, nossa, a minha proposta para a discussão, e que tem sido feita já, está sendo executada, eu já falo um pouquinho sobre isso, né? precisam, na realidade, o seguinte, quatro bases. Energia, curiosamente, matéria, que foi explorada muito pelo primeiro speaker, né? filosofia e antropologia. Com isso aqui, e com as linguagens, o, o, o RNA, o equivalente ao RNA uh, de transporte, são as linguagens. Linguagens e sinais, matemática e computação, modelagem matemática e artes. São esses três tipos de linguagem e quatro bases. Eu uh, estou muito convencido que com isso, com isso, nós podemos, podemos mostrar, montar todos os processos de transformação que estão colocados aqui. Dependendo de quantas, como nós combinamos essas bases né? e como nós usamos essa linguagem. Mas todos os estudantes, a proposta é essa, todos os estudantes numa universidade têm que estar expostos durante o seu curso, possivelmente para um, um bachelor's degree, né? a essas quatro disciplinas. Isso está sendo executado não totalmente, mas uh, parcialmente, bastante, uma solução bastante próxima, que é a Universidade Federal do ABC, que foi criada em 2015. Uh, isso que está aqui uh, é executado, isso aqui também, menos artes, né? e em vez de filosofia e antropologia, tem um curso geral de filosofia. Esse aí está mais especificado, está mais separado. Então, uh, e, te, e até agora tem sido feito com bastante sucesso. Eu quero dizer também que isso está sendo discutido na USP, Universidade de São Paulo, para ver se ela... É muito difícil fazer, mudar uma universidade ongoing, quando ela está em, em, em marcha, mas uh, eu acho que é absolutamente necessário. Né? Então, essa é, 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 é a nossa proposta para enfrentar não apenas o um mercado de trabalho, mas enfrentar a vida tudo aquilo que os estudantes, os egressos vão encontrar ao longo da sua carreira. Né? Com esse viés, essa possibilidade de andar com as próprias pernas. Eles têm que enfrentar os novos problemas com os conhecimentos mais básicos. E aqui ele tem que considerar não apenas a tecnologia, mas como é que ela impacta a sociedade com ela mesma. Né? Então, seria a, a formação da vida intelectual, vamos dizer assim. A Universidade de, de Harvard tem uma coisa parecida, não é bem assim, é mais livre, mas enfim, está mais ou menos nesse, dentro dessa linha. Os americanos, os bachelors de Green nos Estados Unidos caminham muito nesse sentido. Né? Então, isso também é um complemento do que eu queria dizer, que nós estamos numa era que é mais do que a era do conhecimento, nós estamos numa era de choque cultural. Isso tem que ser visto com bastante cuidado, porque há uns anos atrás havia essa possibilidade de se adaptar às universidades e os empregos e os tipos de trabalho ao mundo em que se ia vivendo, porque havia tempo para isso. Nós não temos mais esse tempo, eu acho que todos nós estamos conscientes disso. Né? Não há mais esse tempo. Portanto, tudo anda muito rapidamente, é realmente essa área de choque cultural, 
Eu uh, trago essa imagem porque isso, na realidade, tecnicamente é uma onda de choque. Né? Essa onda é tecnicamente uma onda de choque. E o que, que acontece numa onda de choque? Nós não podemos nadar. Nós estávamos acostumados a nadar. Né? Há 20 anos atrás, nós podíamos nadar, ver qual é o melhor estilo de natação para chegar de um ponto a outro. Numa onda de choque, não há possibilidade de se nadar. As decisões têm que ser muito rápidas. Nós precisamos de uma prancha. Então, essa é uma imagem que eu costumo trazer para estimular um pouco o pensamento e as ações do, do, dos dirigentes. Né? E, complementando a isso, então, nós não temos muito tempo para pensar, para tomar essas decisões. É necessário tomar riscos. Eu acho que no mundo inteiro existe esse problema. Né? Eu falo um pouco aqui do nosso país também, que a gente tem medo de tomar riscos. É necessário arriscar. É necessário para fazer mudanças rápidas, como um surfista tem que fazer. Ele tem que uh, se dirigir na direção certa para que ele não caia. Então, as decisões têm que ser rápidas. É necessário desafiar as regras tradicionais. Quer dizer, há muita regra, há muito eh, padrão para ser obedecido que não vale mais. Então, nós precisamos ter a coragem de uh, desafiar esses padrões e tomar decisões que, às vezes, não são uh, tão, não estão muito concatenadas com o que a tradição nos indica. É necessário achar um... Pensem nisso, nós precisamos de uma prancha, porque uh, para atravessar esse, essa... Surfar numa onda, nós precisamos de uma prancha, então isso aqui é importante pensar. É necessário para estar preparado para cair e levantar, né? e não há soluções únicas também. Quer dizer, eu fiz uma proposta que está dando certo, mas existem soluções variadas. Então, mas é bom que se pense nisso. O, o essencial dessa, dessa proposta é preparar para a vida, né? não apenas para uma profissão. Finalmente, eu quero uh, ver essa uh, statement do Einstein, né? the finest emotion of which are capable in the mystic emotion. Isso é um cientista, né? The finest emotion of which we are capable is the mystic emotion. Here lies the germ of all art and true science. Etc., etc. Anyone to whom this feeling is alien, who is no longer capable of wonderment and lives in a state of fear, is a dead man. É interessante ver que um grande cientista diz o seguinte: é preciso que a gente tenha sentimentos. Quer dizer, a verdadeira caminho intelectual passa pelos uh, sentimentos e pela pela vida, pela de alguma forma um pensamento transcendental. É isso que ele está dizendo aí, né? E, finalmente, eu quero mostrar isso. Nós estamos numa encruzilhada mesmo. Então, a nossa pergunta é o seguinte. Esse cidadão está olhando para leste ou oeste? Se olhar para leste, há uma perspectiva de dia que sobe. Mas, se estiver olhando para o oeste, nós vamos ficar numa tremenda escuridão. Essa... As reflexões que são trazidas nessa academia me parecem extremamente importantes porque são críticas para o futuro da humanidade. Não é apenas um país, né? é o caminho da civilização. De modo que vamos ser otimistas né? e esperar que nós estejamos vivendo uma nova Alexandria. Né? Muito mais rápida, mas com a convergência dos vários conhecimentos e a convivência dessas pessoas. Bom, era isso que eu tinha a dizer. Obrigado. Thank you, Professor Baby Dacqua. If I may, I just uh, would like to, to add, uh, uh, you see the last slide of Professor Baby Dacqua, uh, uh, east or west. And so, you know, the answer, I mean, uh, if, we, if you if you reasoning at, at a, a transdisciplinary level, you know the answer quite easily, is both hand is not either or any longer, because if you apply either or solution, you are in the past. Okay, so that's, that was my, my little note to things. So we, we did both of them together. So uh, any question, please?
if we are going to be educated for life, what kind of way we can include in the curriculum to encourage the love of the students for the fellow human beings? Is there any way to do that, I ask? Well, it would be presumptuous for, for me to, to provide the answer to that, but uh, I believe that uh, there should be, for sure, more the humanities they should uh, come back. Uh, we, need, we need them. I, I myself, I remember when I was a student, I was a student in mathematics and physics, and I actually I didn't give much, much value to, to all of those things. Uh, I came to appreciate them much, er, much later uh, in, in my life. Uh, and uh, so I, I see now that uh, my say, early years would probably have been much better if I had had some introduction to, to philosophy or to even to economics. Yes, much, much later I decided to study economics, but at the beginning I, it was not important to me. So f especially for young people, uh, we can try to show to them the value of all those other, other fields. Not much to add, but uh, I, I think it's absolutely necessary in the undergraduate education that the students could be able or to learn in, I mean, as, as I mentioned, technology or science, nature science, which matter and energy. I think these two are, are the basis. Okay? And uh, uh, in, in humanities, I think the two more important uh, topics would be anthropology and philosophy. See? And with these four, of course, with different orientations, because each professor could uh, put some of their own uh, emphasis, they would be able to have a, the basic knowledge for life. And uh, after this uh, first stage, which would be the bachelor degree, they can go deeper in uh, other topics, you see. This is what I think. But it's not, uh, uh, we cannot also forget about the languages, and the languages are mathematics and computation, or the science and the language itself, right, and arts. Uh, in general, we are forgetting arts in our society. And uh, fortunately, in several universities, uh, arts is being recovered and uh, is being uh, taught in some course and offer to the students. It's not easy to make this choice, but uh, I think it's possible. This is my third attempt today to ask the question. I, I failed two times, but at least I did not give up, and then I got the time <laughs> to ask questions. Congratulations, both uh, speakers, your excellent presentations. Uh, if I may use uh, an antro presentation to my students or also on the colleagues I would use as a model PowerPoint presentation. Minimum text, maximum symbols, which really boost our imagination and we will longer re uh, remember the symbols than the text. So this is something what we professors very often uh, make mistake. We put too much text, you know, and then people cannot go through and so on, but missing the symbols which really boost our brain and then uh, stay longer. Uh, anyway, I would like to come to the issue both speakers touched uh, and to some extent explained uh, uh, Marcel Professor uh, statement that we are uh, educating for life. Not from his pre today presentation, but from his earlier uh, uh, interventions. I was listening carefully. And I understood him that he treated education, doesn't matter whether this is the, for the person or for the university, for organization, as a learning organization, which constantly creates his, her, or its future. From that point of view, if we are learning constantly, we create our future and we have our jobs forever. This is something we need to have, I mean, dynamic approach, not static, and then we will be in safe place. So this is my, instead of question, is my comment in defense or explanation of Marcel. Thank you. 
Yeah, if I make may make a comment about uh, I I thank you for your appreciation of uh, of the PowerPoint I prepared, and uh, I think that is a good example of learning, because uh, I used to make PowerPoints uh, with plenty of text and no images at all, but I learned this from my wife very recently, and it is proving uh, quite effective. Do we have time for a third question? Thank you. I'd just like to make a very short uh, comment. You, the, the three papers emphasize more the uh, scientific part. And uh, I think that science cannot exist without cognitive and conscious thinking. And uh, the method that we uh, presented in the yesterday and the day before yesterday is extremely important for education nowadays because people forgot the contact, the personal contact and the collaborating spirit that comes only from the frontal lobe. And we have to reactivate this special element which really distinguishes between us and the animals. So I think that what we suggested is a prerequisite to all the methods that were mentioned here. Thank you. OK, so uh, I declare close uh, panel nine.